Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. Early in the morning on April 19th, 2011, Terry Kennedy left her home for her one-on-one Pilates session at the Glen Eagles Country Club in Plano, Texas. Her teacher, Susan Loper, had been a fitness instructor for over two decades, and she had been working with Terry for 15 years, so the women were close friends. When Terry arrived at 6.18 a.m. for her 6.15 appointment, she was shocked to find Susan wasn't there. Susan was always on time and never missed a class. In fact, Susan had a strict daily morning routine. She would leave her house at 5.15 a.m., get Starbucks, and arrive at the club's Pilates studio by 6 a.m. But Terry noticed that Susan's car wasn't even in the parking lot, and the lights in the club's studio were off. Terry left the club, but was concerned for her longtime instructor and friend. Where was she? Terry sent Susan a text saying that she had missed her at the studio and hoped everything was okay. The whole situation was off, and Terry had a bad feeling in her stomach. Hours later, ammunition and a significant amount of blood would be discovered in the driveway in front of the studio. It was Susan's blood. Welcome to episode 162, The Stalking and Murder of Susan Loper. Susan Nicole Loper was born on April 13, 1974, in Wichita Falls, Texas, to her loving parents, Morris and Catherine. She also had a sister named Leah. In 1989, Susan graduated early from S.H. Ryder High School at only 15 years old. Susan was described by her high school friends as a ray of sunshine, the most giving, loving, and kind person. After graduating early, Susan traveled over 1,500 miles across the country to attend the American Musical and Dramatic Academy in New York City. This would have been a big move for anyone, but especially for young Susan. For perspective, the drive between Wichita Falls and New York City is 24 hours. It's clear that Susan was not afraid to chase her dreams. Nothing would get in her way. After graduating from the Academy, Susan starred in off-Broadway shows, plays, and musicals. Later, Susan began a second career in the fitness industry and earned numerous certifications. For 21 years, she was a personal trainer, nutritional counselor, and fitness instructor. She specialized in teaching aerobics, Pilates, and yoga. She spent 16 years working as a Pilates instructor at the Glen Eagles Country Club in Plano, Texas. The Glen Eagles Country Club is composed of several buildings on a sprawling estate with a gorgeous 18-hole golf course. It's a fancy invite-only club, so you can't just pay a fee and walk in. Which makes sense for a city like Plano, which was reported as the most affluent big city in the U.S. by the Census Bureau in 2008. Their median household income was 84000 at the time, and today has risen to 96000 This is a city not accustomed to violent crime. To illustrate that, consider this. In 2021, only three homicides were confirmed by the Plano Police Department. That's a shockingly low number for a city with over 270,000 people. For comparison, Birmingham, Alabama has about 200,000 people and experienced just over 100 confirmed homicides in 2021. Plano's problems lie more in offering affordable housing and tax increases than in murder. While working at the Glen Eagles Country Club in Plano, Susan married a man named Craig. They had a son together named Jake. Craig spent a great deal of time away on business trips which strained their marriage. By the spring of 2006, Susan had had enough of Craig's absences. Though she was still married, 
she began dating a man named Terrence Black. Susan and Terrence dated consistently for about one year, but were on and off again after that. Susan and her husband Craig were divorced in 2007, but the couple remained friendly. They often spent time together while co-parenting their son Jake. In May of 2009, Susan became pregnant with her sometimes boyfriend, Terrence Black's child. She chose to get an abortion, which upset Terrence. He claimed Susan had killed his child and threatened her by saying, I'm going to kill you someday. Unsurprisingly, the two broke up permanently in August of 2009. But Terrence wasn't through with Susan. Over the next couple of years, he would continuously stalk her. The Office for Victims of Crime, or OVC, describes stalking as a pattern of behavior directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to feel fear. Because stalking is a pattern of behavior, it can consist of a variety of activities where the stalker intends to control their victim or cause them fear. A victim might notice they are being followed or that someone is driving by their workplace frequently. The victim could receive unwanted gifts, texts, or phone calls. With modern technology, stalking has gotten worse with GPS tracking and inappropriate camera recordings. The majority of stalking victims are women, and the majority of stalkers are men. According to the OVC, 75% of stalking victims were stalked by someone they know, and 30% were once intimate partners with their stalkers. An ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend is the most dangerous type of stalker. They often have intimate and personal knowledge about their victim most others aren't privy to, which leads them to be more insulting, interfering, and threatening. And unsurprisingly, if a former intimate partner is stalking a woman, the chance is significantly higher that they will murder that woman. And most victims don't report stalking to the police. According to a 2019 report from the U.S. Department of Justice, less than a third of all victims reported their stalker to authorities. Victims don't report for a number of reasons, but one of the most common ones is that they're worried the stalking behaviors aren't that serious. A victim might think, so my ex follows me home after work three nights a week. At least I'm not being murdered or robbed. Other reasons for unreported stalking include that the victim dealt with the stalking in a different way, like changing their daily routine or phone number, or they worried police couldn't stop their stalker. They worried police wouldn't stop their stalker. And that they just feared their stalker that much. A few months after Terrence and Susan broke up, In January 2010, Susan met a man named Jason Hayes through the dating website eHarmony. Susan and Jason fell for each other quickly. Only one month after meeting in February 2010, they were an official couple. That May, Terrence discovered Susan was dating Jason. He was infuriated. He took flowers to Susan's mother Catherine's house, supposedly for her birthday which was clearly a ruse to make contact with Catherine. Catherine recalled Terrence being agitated and obsessive during this encounter. He told Catherine he believed he, Susan, and Susan's son, Jake, would make such a nice family. He warned Catherine that Susan's boyfriend, Jason, had baggage, and he couldn't understand why Susan liked bad guys. Regardless of Terrence's stalking behavior, Susan flourished. After years of experience as a fitness expert at the Glen Eagles Country Club, she decided it was time for her to open her own Pilates studio. Her last day at the club was set for April 19th, 2011, just six days after her 40th birthday. April 19th began as most days did for Susan Loper. She woke early in the morning and left for work at about 5.15 a.m. You can just imagine the spring in her step, this lovely spring morning, her last day at Glen Eagle before she opened her own studio. 
As she always did, she stopped for a Starbucks drink on her commute. Typically, Susan walked in the door of the club's Pilates studio at around 6 a.m. The studio was housed in a small freestanding building a short walk away from the main Glen Eagles Country Club facility. And Susan was essentially on her own until her clients arrived. Susan's Pilates student of 15 years, Terry Kennedy, arrived for her standing appointment with Susan at 6.15 a.m., but Susan was nowhere to be found. Terry noticed that her car wasn't in the parking lot and the studio lights were off. She was surprised. Susan never missed an appointment. Worried for her safety, Terry texted her, but Susan never replied. Later that day, a housekeeper at the club found a purse on the ground by the back door of the studio. The straps of the purse were stuck in the studio door. The housekeeper gave the purse to their supervisor, who gave it to the receptionist to put in Lost and Found. No one looked inside the purse, and why would they? A person was probably going to return to retrieve it at any moment. By 10 a.m., more clients had arrived at the club studio for their scheduled appointments with Susan, who was still nowhere to be found. Her car wasn't in the parking lot yet, and the club's Pilates studio lights were still off. When an employee went to the studio to turn the lights on, a client noticed the studio was in complete disarray. A room divider had fallen. A plant was tipped over onto the ground. Glass shards littered the mats. A tote bag was discarded on the floor, and a Starbucks drink was spilled. Something was wrong. The client immediately called the general manager, who asked the receptionist to look in the recently found purse. They found Susan's ID in the purse. Now alarmed, the general manager called the police. The first officer on scene quickly determined that there had been a struggle in the studio based on the mess. He noticed blood on the floor and two unfired rounds of ammunition. He made these observations from afar because he didn't want to traipse through the crime scene. He requested backup, and when more officers arrived, they found the following. There were significant amounts of blood in the driveway in front of the studio's building. A small amount of blood was located on the studio's back door and inside the studio. In the bushes outside the front door was an unfired round of ammunition. They also found a receipt for Susan's Starbucks order on the cup. She had purchased the drink at 5.45 a.m. Officers noted that Susan's purse and cell phone had not been taken, but her keys and SUV had. They quickly realized this was not a robbery but a violent kidnapping. Authorities believed it happened at about 6 a.m. Authorities believed it happened at about 6 a.m. based on the 5.45 a.m. Starbucks receipt and Terry's arrival at 6.15. Detective Bruce Fawning, who was at the crime scene, visited Susan's boyfriend, Jason. The news of her disappearance shocked Jason. He had just seen her a couple of days ago on Easter Sunday. They hadn't seen each other Monday, but had plans to meet up that day, which was Tuesday, April 19th, later in the day. Jason and Susan were going to move Susan's studio equipment from the club to her new location. Throughout the investigation, Jason was never considered a suspect. As a true crime aficionado, I'm sure you find this odd. The boyfriend didn't do it, but more than Jason's genuine emotional response to Susan's disappearance, his alibi was airtight. On the morning of the 19th, Jason got up around 6.15 and worked out before getting ready for work. He was a pharmaceutical representative, so his hours started early, similar to Susan's schedule. He left his home in Arlington and drove to a doctor's office in Burleson, Texas. As a part of his job, Jason used a company-issued iPad, which showed that he logged in at 8.02 a.m., at 8.18 a.m., a Dr. Nelson signed an electronic form acknowledging that he had received samples from Jason. Dr. Nelson later confirmed that he had signed for samples as the iPad record showed and that there was nothing weird about Jason's demeanor that morning. Jason, logistically, couldn't have been kidnapping Susan. 
As a result of this information, police never searched Jason's house, car, cell phone, or computers. They also never interviewed any of Jason's friends, family, or exes. When he spoke with law enforcement, Jason told Detective Fawning that Susan was beloved by everyone, except her ex-boyfriend, Terrence Black. Detective Fawning felt that Jason was cooperative and that his response was consistent with someone who found out their loved one was missing. Next, Fawning and another detective, Scott Epperson, went to Susan's home to speak with her parents. As usual, Susan's parents babysat her son Jake at Susan's home while she was at work. Susan's parents still lived in Wichita Falls, where Susan was born, but they commuted over two hours to Susan's home in Frisco constantly to help her take care of Jake. Jason soon arrived at the house, too. Detective Epperson spoke with Jason and agreed with Fawning. He was cooperative and had a consistent response to his girlfriend's kidnapping. Susan's parents told the detectives that Terrence and Susan ended their relationship on poor terms, and Terrence had become obsessed with her. They described his actions as smothering. On multiple occasions, Terrence tried to rekindle his relationship with Susan, but she always refused, which made him very angry. Susan's ex-husband, Craig, also talked to Detective Epperson and said that he had a physical altercation with Terrence when Terrence had been angry and combative towards Susan. Detectives realized that Terrence Black had been stalking Susan Loper. He would tamper with the gate security device at her house. He would go through her emails and dating profiles without Susan's permission. Later, it would be revealed Terrence had access to many of Susan's online accounts because he knew her usual passwords. This isn't uncommon for stalkers. As technology has evolved, cyberstalking has increased. According to the OVC, one in four stalking victims report being stalked through technology, like email and text messages. Terrence also showed other typical stalker behavior. He gave Susan expensive, unwanted gifts like a laptop or a flat screen TV. He would show up uninvited and unannounced at Susan's home, work, and other places she frequented. She could not escape Terrence's menacing presence. And Susan wasn't Terrence's first victim. Police discovered that in 1995, Terrence shook a previous girlfriend hard, then stopped her from calling 911. He also wrote slut on this former girlfriend's house. In 2004 and 2005, Terrence terrorized a different woman in Frisco, Texas. Similar to his torment of Susan, Terrence would show up at this Frisco woman's house without an invitation. He would also call and text her repeatedly. Following their conversation with Susan's parents, detectives Fawning and Epperson went to Terrence's house in Frisco but he wasn't home. For reference, Frisco is about 20 minutes away from Plano, Texas, where Susan worked at the club. It's the city where Susan lived, too. Meanwhile, Detective Fred Garcia reviewed the club's security video recordings. In court documents, Garcia would later report that the video quality was poor and the area was poorly lit, but the video depicts a vehicle pulling into the parking lot at approximately 5.55 a.m. and parking off-camera. This is likely Susan arriving at work after stopping at Starbucks. It's important to note, Susan drove a 2010 white Toyota RAV4 that she had borrowed from her parents to move her studio equipment. Garcia will refer to it as a white SUV. Garcia continued, Moments later, a person can be seen walking towards the Pilates studio but the image is obscured by trees and foliage. At around 6 a.m., a person can be seen walking toward the area where the vehicle parked, and seconds later, a white SUV with its headlights illuminated pulled up to the driveway by the Pilates studio. It is suspected that Terrence entered the Pilates studio, beat Susan, stole her keys, and drove her SUV up to the studio door. At this time, Susan is probably badly hurt inside. Garcia goes on to say, at 6.01 a.m., the driver exits the vehicle, 
leaves the driver's side door open, and walks around the front of the SUV toward the Pilates studio. Less than a minute later, a person is seen walking from the rear of the SUV to the driver's door, which is still open. The same person walks back around the rear of the vehicle and is obscured from view for about one minute before walking around the front of the car and getting into the driver's seat and closing the door. The vehicle drives away at approximately 6.02 a.m. The police found a significant amount of blood in the driveway of the Pilates studio, exactly where the passenger side of the SUV would have been when it was parked. This probably was Terrence dragging an injured Susan to the SUV passenger side. He had had to pull the car closer to the studio to get her into the vehicle. Unfortunately, it's difficult to know the exact specifics because the footage was so terrible. However, based on the situation and other damning evidence, we're pretty sure this is how it happened. Other evidence clearly points to Terrence as Susan's violent kidnapper. For example, Susan had a toll tag in her vehicle, which pays for tolls automatically as a person drives under sensors on the interstate. Police used the toll tag records to track Susan's car. With this information, they found her locked Toyota RAV4 in a parking lot of an apartment complex less than one mile from the club. When searching the RAV4, Police found blood and hair on the right front passenger window, a large amount of blood in the front and back seats, and a bloody handprint on the outside of the vehicle. Unfortunately, they couldn't retrieve fingerprints from the handprint, most likely because the kidnapper was wearing latex gloves. The hair recovered from the right front passenger window had similarities to Terrence's hair. DNA collected from the gear shift and headrest of the RAV4 was consistent with a mixture of Susan, Terrence, her boyfriend Jason, and an unknown person's DNA. After obtaining a search warrant, police searched Terrence's home on April 20th, 2011 at 5.30 a.m. He wasn't home. It had been approximately 24 hours since Susan was kidnapped. There was no incriminating evidence like blood or a gun or ammunition in the house, but detectives did find suspicious handwritten notes in Terrence's desk drawer. The handwritten notes mentioned Susan by name. One note had the title Magic Formula written at the top. It read, Number one, I desire my lover, Susan, to love me and only me. I want her to be faithful to me Love me unconditionally and be loyal to me. Number two, I always receive whatever I ask for. Number three, I will not question or judge how it will come about. If I make no judgment of myself, whatever I wish for will be granted. Number four, I will express my gratitude. What a freaking weirdo. Anyway, next. Officers headed to a highway exit for Lebanon Road. Using the toll tag information, they determined the RAV4 spent more time at this exit than in any other location. Additionally, they found green vegetation in the RAV4's front grille, the right front floor mat, and the right front running board. The car had clearly been driven through an off-road plant-filled area. With this in mind, Officer Joel Scott searched a field near the Lebanon Road exit. He had been the first officer on scene at the Pilates studio when the manager called 911. Scott found fresh tire marks, which he tracked on foot. And then he found a woman's body at 8.35 a.m. She was nude from the neck down, had a sweater covering her face, and her arms were over her head. Her pants and underwear were around her ankles. One she was on, and the other was laying nearby. Officer Scott also discovered two unfired bullets within 20 feet of the body. At first, law enforcement was reluctant to confirm the identity of the body of Susan because its condition made it difficult to determine the body's race or age. Eventually, they did confirm that this was the body of 40-year-old Susan Loper. The medical examiner who evaluated the crime scene determined the back of Susan's skull 
was crushed like an eggshell. That is to say, extremely fragmented and had caved in. The autopsy showed Susan died due to blunt force trauma to the head with a hard object, maybe a gun. She had suffered one blow to the forehead and at least seven blows to the back of her head. The intensity of the blows Susan received demonstrated her attacker's intent to kill. Despite how Susan's clothes were found, there was no sign of sexual assault. This could be for any number of reasons. Maybe the killer intended to rape Susan, but changed his mind. Maybe he wanted this to look like a sex crime, that Susan was kidnapped and raped by a stranger. And maybe it was the ultimate indignity to leave her body in a state of undress. There was also no gunshot wound, which would be of significance. When Susan's body was discovered, her family and friends were gathered at her home. They had been hoping that Susan would be found alive. They had posted on social media websites like Facebook, asking the public for help in Susan's swift and safe return. Upon the confirmation that her body had been discovered, they struggled to accept the news. Susan's friend Marla told Time Record News, It's a gut-wrenching feeling, something that left us all in total shock. It's hard because I'm sitting in her house, and I know I'm never going to see her walk through the door again. Susan and Marla had been friends since their sophomore year of high school. Marla described being overwhelmed by the situation. She said, You hear about these kinds of things happening. You see them on TV, but have no idea it could hit so close to home. Several people have asked me, how do you wrap your head around something like this? I've just been at a loss for words. I just don't know. Susan's funeral was held on Wednesday, April 27, 2011, at Hope Fellowship Church in Frisco, Texas. Her friends explained to the Times Record News that Everyone who met her loved her, and that she was someone who truly loved life and was an amazing mother and friend. Meanwhile, one of Terrence's neighbors sent him a text saying she was sorry for what had happened to Susan. Terrence replied, What happened to Susan? I've been out of town since Monday. He claimed he had been in El Paso because he needed to get away. She didn't want to break the tragic news about Susan over text, so she told Terrence to call her. Twenty minutes later, he did, and she told him what had happened. The neighbor said Terrence seemed upset. She asked Terrence when he last spoke to Susan, and he said it was in December of 2010. Police obtained Terrence's cell phone records and discovered he had not been in El Paso since Monday. In fact, he had been in Frisco at 7.28 a.m. on April 19th, the day Susan was abducted a mere 20-minute drive away. Actually, Terrence wasn't in El Paso until 6.39 p.m. that evening. From there, he made his way to Flagstaff, Arizona, and had arrived there at 2.45 p.m. the next day. On April 22nd, Grand Canyon Park Rangers received a call about a panhandler at a scenic overlook. The Rangers found Terrence talking to a group of people. They asked him for identification, but he said he had lost his money belt, which had his ID in it. He said his name was Jeffrey Stevens and gave the Rangers a fake date of birth. The Rangers attempted to look up his information, but couldn't find anything with the false name. Terrence said he was going to look for his lost money belt and began walking down a trail. The Rangers ordered him to stop, but he went down a steep slope at the edge of the Grand Canyon and suddenly jumped. According to the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, a tourist who watched the debacle said she saw Terrence leap off the edge of the Grand Canyon like he was diving into a swimming pool. Terrence landed 25 feet down in a sloped area with thickets. At first, he appeared unconscious, but then he began moving around. Rangers told Terrence he was in danger of falling into the real Grand Canyon, meaning that a steep and deadly drop was just over a ridge. A tactical rope team reached Terrence with guns drawn, handcuffed him, and removed him from the slope using an aircraft. He was flown to a nearby hospital and immediately put in custody for a capital murder charge. 
The rangers found Terrence's real driver's license partially buried in the dirt near where they had first encountered him. Two days later, the rangers investigated the area where they had found Terrence. They discovered his key fob, also partially buried in the dirt. Two days later, at a different location, the rangers found a handwritten note that said, Family, so sorry for all the pain. I've been in pain for a while now. Debts were too high, school too long, and made too many mistakes in life. Thanks for all you have done, especially Wendy and her support. I just can't mooch any longer. Pray for me. Love you all. The back side of the note said, Extremely depressed. Someone killed Susan. She was amazing. Later, Terrence's defense attorneys would confirm he was trying to commit suicide at the Grand Canyon. On April 22nd, Detective Epperson went to Arizona with a search warrant for Terrence's vehicle. In it, Epperson found clothes, a suitcase, two laptops, an iPhone, a passport, two knives, and a suicide note. When the laptops were examined, authorities discovered that Terrence had been remotely accessing Susan's email without her permission since before her murder. One email, which Terrence saw, said that Susan's last day at Glen Eagle would be on April 19th. In the email, Susan let her client know that she would be at the Club Pilates studio on that day by 6.30 a.m. This is how Terrence knew exactly when and where to kidnap and murder Susan. Also in his laptop files, Terrence had a photo of Susan and Jason that was photographed last Valentine's Day. The file was entitled Whore. Terrence's calendar app on his iPhone revealed key evidence in proving that he had been obsessed with Susan since their split in 2009. Terrence used the calendar app as a journal with multiple entries. Here are a few of those entries. November 29th, 2009. Lost her again. Fucking eHarmony. December 13th, 2009. Last time I saw her, and God must help. April 20th, 2010. By G. The G probably stands for gun. May 3rd, 2010. D-Day. I gotta go. Can't let a bastard have my hard work. December 9th. 2010. Decision Day for Smoke Her. March 11th, 2011 and April 4th, 2011 both said Smoke Her. He had been planning this for a year. Terrence had purchased a 9mm handgun and two boxes of ammunition from a Fort Worth Cabela's on June 21st, 2010. The bullets found in the club's Pilates studio and in the field where Susan's body was found matched the bullets that Terrence had purchased. After the Grand Canyon incident, Terrence spent months in Arizona, not wanting to be extradited to Texas. At the time, he was also recovering from severe injuries that occurred when he leapt off the cliff at the canyon. Later, in his trial photos, he is pictured wearing a neck brace and medical halo. Finally, Terrence was extradited to Texas, arrested, and held on a $1 million bond. On August 20th, 2012, Terrence's trial began. A firearms expert testified that the unfired rounds found in the club's Pilates studio and the field were likely due to Terrence's inexperience with his gun. When the safety is engaged, a live round will be ejected. A friend of Terrence's confirmed this theory, explaining that Terrence was not knowledgeable about firearms. It's likely that he tried to kill Susan with a gun, but since he didn't know how to turn the safety off, he resorted to beating Susan to death with the gun. The gun was never found. During the trial, the prosecution explained that Terrence parked his vehicle in the same apartment complex where police found Susan's SUV. Then, Terrence walked a mile to the Glen Eagles Country Club, hurt Susan bad enough for her to bleed a lot, then kidnapped her, took her to the field, and killed her. Next, he drove her RAV4 to the apartment complex parking, got in his vehicle, and left Susan's RAV4 there. In their arguments, the prosecution pointed out how significant it was 
that Terrence's DNA was found on the gear shift and headrest of Susan's car, meaning he had probably driven it recently. Remember, they had been broken up for almost two years. Terrence's defense argued that the police rushed to judgment and had decided by 6 p.m. the day Susan died that Terrence was the killer. They suggested that law enforcement was filling in the gaps in this case with unreliable guesswork, only pursuing evidence that led to Terrence's arrest. They criticized law enforcement for never considering Susan's boyfriend, Jason, as a suspect. Besides never searching his items, Terrence's lawyers demonstrated that Jason and Susan had broken up a month before Susan's murder, which was corroborated by a text message exchange between Susan and her friend in March 2011. The Fort Worth Star-Telegram reported that Susan texted her girlfriend, quote, Looks like I will be rejoining eHarmony, and also said, I will be back on the market real soon. In another text, sent two days later, Susan said, Jason and I are over for good. But after this, Susan and Jason continued texting frequently, and he was helping her move her Pilates equipment to her new studio. Life is messy. Couples break up and get back together. Women insist to their friends that they are done, when in reality, they are angry, but not broken up. I've done it. You've done it. It happens all the time. The defense also called attention to the police never interviewing Jason's ex-wives, who they had tried to claim showed Jason's history of aggressive and violent behavior. Prior to the trial, the court held a hearing to determine what evidence would be admissible in the trial. This is standard procedure to protect the jury from being confused by irrelevant information. It's known as Rule 403, or the Prejudice Rule. It helps avoid unfair bias, misleading the jury, and wasting time in the trial process. At the hearing, Jason's first wife testified that while she and Jason were married for less than a year, he was emotionally abusive, controlling, and had gotten violent on two occasions, though she never filed charges. After their marriage ended, she said Jason did not contact her again. Jason's second wife testified that they were married a little over two years, and while he was never technically violent, he was very controlling. She was also embroiled in a nasty custody battle with Jason for their daughter that had been going on for six years, including at the time of Susan Loper's death. After Susan's death, she sent an email to Jason stating that he could not come see their daughter during their scheduled Thursday night visit. She said she was uncomfortable with the media coverage of Susan's murder and thought Jason needed time to grieve. According to court documents, Jason left a message stating that Susan's death was, quote, no big deal, and he intended to visit his daughter. When they spoke on the phone, she said Jason became enraged, so she handed the phone to her current husband. Jason said he would come over and kill him, but it was just talk. The husband testified that Jason often threatened him with violence, but no one was ever physically struck. He also said that he had called Jason to apologize on one occasion, so it would seem that there was plenty of back and forth between the men. I would also say that I wouldn't take that no big deal comment too seriously. Jason was trying to see his daughter and minimizing. None of the information regarding Jason's history of violence against his ex-wives was deemed admissible into court under Rule 403, so the jury never heard it. Here's what the jury did hear from Terrence's defense. Jason would have known Susan's work schedule well, so he could have pinpointed when she would have been most vulnerable for attack. And Jason was the first person to mention Terrence to law enforcement. Jason's timeline is what kept him from being considered a suspect. How could he have a signature from Dr. Nelson at 8.18 a.m. and have had time to kidnap, murder, and hide the body of Susan? Terrence's lawyers argued that there was time. A private investigator employed by the defense tested the route. The PI drove from the apartment complex where Susan's RAV4 was abandoned to Dr. Nelson's office. At 93 minutes, the trip took too long for Jason to have left the RAV4 at 6.38 a.m. 
and reached his next destination by 8.02 a.m. But the P.I. argued that the length of her trip was due to unexpected traffic from a wreck. When the P.I. tested the trip a second time, she made it in 73 minutes, indicating Jason could maybe have made the trip with about 10 minutes to spare. That's pretty tight. But that's what paid experts do. Try to make the impossible possible. Terrence's defense put Susan's hairstylist of many years on the stand, a woman named Deanna. She met Jason in January 2011, which would have been a year after Susan and Jason began dating. Nothing remarkable stood out to Deanna about their relationship at this point. But when Susan came in for a hair appointment on April 9th, 10 days before her murder, Deanna said Susan wasn't excited about Jason. When he came up in conversation, Deanna described Susan's demeanor as flat. With this in mind, when Deanna heard her friend Susan was missing, she was the one to call the police department and provide Jason's information, which she had from when Jason attempted to purchase Deanna's services as a birthday gift for Susan. Ultimately, this wasn't hard evidence against Jason either. And while it is upsetting to hear about Jason's past, there is no indication that his relationship with Susan was ever violent. As I said, they had broken up but gotten back together per Susan's text messages with her friend and with Jason. And he was helping her move her Pilates studio. I think Deanna just saw her friend on a bad day. But however rocky Jason and Susan's relationship may have been, the presiding judge ruled against admitting Jason's prior relationships. In a hearing outside the presence of the jury, the judge said, only this defendant had the knowledge, the means, the opportunity, and the obsession to commit capital murder. The judge also pointed out Terrence's repeated lies such as the fake name he supplied before jumping from the edge of the Grand Canyon. The judge explained, it tells you he had something to hide. The prosecution reiterated to the jurors that the idea that Jason was involved in Susan's death was a smokescreen to distract from Terrence's guilt. Additionally, Terrence's defense brushed off how he relentlessly stalked Susan. His defense lawyer said, Terrence logged into Susan's accounts without permission to reminisce. So, this illegal invasion of privacy is just Terrence thinking about the good old days? Susan's close friend, Marla Malone, gave a victim impact statement while Susan's mother, Catherine, stood at her side. Marla said, quote, Your selfishness put a permanent scar on the lives of so many. You, Terrence Deering Black will be forgotten and left to rot away in a cell in a Texas state prison for the rest of your pitiful life. On April 30th, 2012, a little over one year after Susan's murder, the jury deliberated for four and a half hours after eight days of testimony from dozens of witnesses before they reached their verdict. Terrence was guilty of capital murder. The prosecution did not seek the death penalty. So 48-year-old Terrence Black was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The Fort Worth Star-Telegram reported that the judge told Terrence, you, sir, are pure evil as he imposed the sentence. Susan's friends and family cried at the announcement. Terrence had no reaction. To this day, he has never publicly admitted his guilt. As a side note, I'm really surprised they did not seek the death penalty. This is Texas, after all. Terrence had the accompanying charge of felony kidnapping to make this a capital case, not to mention it was so very premeditated. But they didn't, and it's doubtful Terrence will ever see the outside of a prison. Currently, he is housed in Palage Prison, a minimum security incarceration facility in Palestine, Texas. Terrence has appealed several times, but to date, all of his appeals have been denied. Susan's murder and Terrence's trial caught the public attention of Texans everywhere. A dynamic fitness instructor had been killed by a man who proceeded to jump off the edge of the Grand Canyon to avoid the authorities. 
you can see why it made the papers. And Susan's death came at a time when Texas was truly struggling with violent crimes against women, especially in the matter of domestic violence. In the city of Dallas alone, more than 13,000 family violence cases were reported, most of them where a woman was the victim. The Austin American Statesman published an article connecting Susan's case and other recent high-profile murders of women to the rise of violence against women in Texas. In August 2011, several months after Susan's death, they reported that experts say the women who report domestic abuse represent only a fraction of the abuse that is out there. The article also reported that Texas women's shelters were busier than ever while combating limited resources due to budget cuts from the Texas government. According to the National Network to End Domestic Violence, over 40% of Texas shelters didn't have enough money to meet the rising need of abused women. While Susan's death wasn't presented as a domestic violence case, Terrence's determination in stalking her and the brutality of the murder helped open the public's eyes to the larger problem throughout the state of Texas. If you or someone you know is the victim of domestic violence, please consider visiting the National Domestic Violence Hotline at thehotline.org. They offer safe ways to communicate with experts who can help, including phone calls, text messages, and online chat options. As always, I will provide resources in today's show notes. And for those of you who can, please donate to your local women's shelters. Every little bit helps. Susan Loper was my age. Somehow, we keep covering cases with victims my age. She was 40 years old when she died. That's so young. She had her whole life ahead of her. A new life with her own Pilates studio. Her dream was coming true. She had an eight-year-old son she did not live to see grow up. She was robbed not only of her own life, but also robbed of the joy of raising her son, watching him graduate, marry, and have children of his own. And her son, only eight years old, lost his mother in an unimaginably violent way. At Susan's funeral, her family requested donations to a trust for her son Jake in lieu of flowers. I hope he got the help he needed to get through his mother's brutal murder. He is a young man now, with his own bright future ahead of him. But no amount of therapy can repair a hole in your life like losing your mother at such a young age, especially to violence. You can learn to accept it, but you always have to live with it. I just hope Jake has found peace. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by Andrea Marshbank with additional writing by me. Southern Fred's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio and the original graphic artist by Coley Horner. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and go to the listener suggestion tab. This is the best way for me to get those little known cases y'all always send me. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messages. With three platforms to manage, that is very overwhelming for me. I hope you understand. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. I much prefer spending my social media time in our lovely group. We do, of course, discuss true crime Not just Southern fraud, but all kinds. But it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit asses loud. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe, and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, Spotify, and now Amazon and Audible. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care. (laughs) 